U.S. National Security Advisor Brzezinski flew to Pakistan to set about rallying resistance. He wanted to arm the Mujahideen without revealing America's role. On the Afghan border near the Khyber Pass, he urged the soldiers of God to redouble their efforts. We know of their deep belief in God, and we are confident that their struggle will succeed. That land over there is yours. You'll go back to it one day because your fight will prevail and you'll have your homes and your mosques back again because your cause is right and God is on your side. Hello everyone and welcome to the second installment of this series looking at the deep history of 9-11 with Adam Fitzgerald. In this particular subsection, we're looking at the role of radical Islam in the history of 9-11 and examining how and why Western governments colluded with extremist Islam in the decades preceding the event. Last time we examined British and American collusion with the Muslim Brotherhood and similar organizations in Egypt, Iran, and Indonesia, looking at the consequences of this, in particular, ultimately leading to the Islamic Revolution in Iran. That took us up to 1979-1980, and that's where we'll pick the story up this week, going to Afghanistan, where this collusion was massively ratcheted up in the Afghan-Soviet War. As you'll hear Adam say in the interview, if you wanted an origin point for the 9-11 attacks, from the Islamic angle, at least, the Afghan war would be about as good a place to place it as any. Now, during my lifetime, Afghanistan has always been in a war-torn state. However, it wasn't always this way. And there's something quite harrowing about looking back to photos from the 60s and 70s of women walking around Kabul in skirts and Westerners driving across the country to seek enlightenment in India. I say harrowing because of what it was and what it's fallen into. So that's where we start off. I ask Adam to talk a bit about the political and social situation in Afghanistan in the years and decades preceding the war that broke out there in the 1980s. Well, considering that Afghanistan is a large uh, ethno state, um, which has a large uh, population of um, Tajiks, uh, Hazaras, Turkmen, and Pashtuns, um, the country um, had seen a revival of liberal modernization under uh, Muhammad Zahir Shah. He was the king during the years of 1933 to 73. Um, and the king actually had um, established friendly relationships with countries that were uh, considered takfiri, non-Muslim. Um, he enjoyed a relative um, peaceful period for 30, 40 years, where during the period of the 1950s and 60s, uh, for example, say uh, women would be allowed to wear uh, westernized style of clothing. Um, religious sectarianism was non-existent, and the economic foundation of Afghanistan prospered, actually. Um, however, uh, in 1973, his cousin, uh, former uh, Prime Minister Mohammed Daoud Khan, uh, staged a coup d'etat and established a, um, a more staunch Republican government while the, the King Zahir Shah was medically exposed. Um, and then in 1978, the country would enter a real transition phase, uh, which would have major uh, consequences in the years to come. And on uh, April 27, 1978, um, the, the Sao Revolution, which was the People's Democratic Party of Afghanistan and the Afghan National Army, uh, committed another coup d'etat on um, Mohammed Daoud Khan. Um, and to, to, for, just to make it clear, the, the uh, People's uh, Democratic uh, Party, or the PDPA in short, I'll make it short, as a, um, a political party based upon uh, secularist um, principles. And during the revolution, it implemented a new leader, Nur, uh, Nur Muhammad Taraki. Um, he was the new leader of Afghanistan, while Daoud would be murdered by members of the party. Um, and he, he, they changed the color, the flag was green, um, the red, I'm, I'm sorry, the near copy red flag of the Soviet Union. So it mimicked a socialist, um, excuse me, socialist value of the Soviet Union. 
And while the Soviet Union uh, catered to uh, Dawood's presidency, um, no, I'm sorry, Taraki's presidency, um, it wasn't really, really strongly aligned with the, uh, the principles under Taraki. But in September of 1970, Taraki was assassinated by another coup uh, within the PDPA, orchestrated by um, a close associate of his, Hafazullah Amin, who, was, who just assumed the presidency. Um, even though Soviet Union um, saw this as a slight and was displeased with Armin, uh, Armin's government, um, they decided to finally intervene. And they invaded the country on December 27, uh, 1979, and they, they killed uh, Amin and his top cabinet. Okay, just, just let me stop you there, if you might. Just, I just want to get a sense of also, um, you see the same tension in Afghanistan, right, that maybe you've, we saw in other Muslim countries of, this rise of secular nationalism, uh, wanting to send girls to school, there's always seemed to be a big theme there, uh, dress codes for women, and there's a tension between people of that kind of outlook and then the more conservative rural areas, more steeped in religion. Um, and that became really intense then when the communists came in in the late 70s. Is that, that a correct kind of view of it? Yes. In fact, the, the people who were... Uh, ironically dead set against the socialist values of the Soviet Union were actually the Islamists in which the nationalists were repressing. Um, uh, the nationalist regime of Afghanistan under Hafizullah Ali, especially Taraki, these two people, um, they were coexisting with the Soviet Union. You know, the Soviet Union um, saw Afghanistan as a mere convenience on the geopolitical level um, in terms of expanding uh, the oil reserves into the Caspian Sea. Um, they they allowed the the repressive nationalist regimes of someone like Hafizullah Ali. Who's I, I, I'm not sticking up for the man. Oh, no, by no means necessary. He killed many people, slaughtered uh, many Pashtuns, and uh, destabilized the religious sector within um, Afghanistan. And so when Hafizullah Ali and the socialists took over, and the Soviets invaded the country. Um, they too also saw um, somehow a commonality with the religious sector, but they saw them as a threat anyway, because um, there's a large Sunni population in Afghanistan. And even though the Taliban itself wasn't as strong as it is, uh, would, would be 10 to 15 years in the future of the start of the war, um, they saw, the Russians saw them as a, an opposing figure, and they had it right. And uh, instead of coexisting with them in order to throw overthrow the nationalists. The Soviets just overthrew the nationalists anyway and started um, taking over the country. And the Islamists themselves saw this as a threat. They didn't want um, the, the socialist ideals to take over. And this was a way also for the Islamists to take power. And even though it was a pipe dream to them because they didn't have the military to overthrow them, but uh, as what we'll talk about in the future, um, it was the United States and Great Britain and other countries that actually assisted the Islamists themselves. Yeah, what I found interesting in researching for this interview was that the, um, there'd been an Islamist influence into Afghanistan throughout the 70s from Afghani students studying at Cairo University and encountering the Muslim Brotherhood and that influence on, on the teaching at the time. Um, because I would have like assumed that the the kind of Islamic fundamentalism thing would be something that went way back and was indigenous to Afghanistan. And whilst it might've been in some forms, it was also something that was, was imported, which kind of follows on from themes we talked about last time about um, the rise and support for organizations like the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. Right. Um, well, the, actually the Muslim Brotherhood in Af you took the, the Afghanistan and Muslim brother in Afghanistan, how they uh, had um, influence. Well, I, I, Afghanistan during the late 50s began to experience this uh, new, new revivalism of sorts. And the Islamist movement, which had originated in Kabul University um, through the Muslim brother, began to take hold. And previously known as uh, the, uh, the originators called the Faculty of Islamic Law, and they began in 1952. Um, where those of the religious sector began to implement um, an idea of religious traditional Islam to accommodate the 
the influence of modern, of modern science and technology. And most of these people were professors um, of the university, of Cairo University, and they were members, high-ranking members of the um, Muslim Brotherhood. Um, and the group itself was dedicated to bringing about uh, not just social uh, and economic and political equity with the Muslim population, but also um, a revivalism of Islamic theology. And um, however prominent um, the Afghan leaders were, however, to the, to the ideology of the Muslim Brotherhood, they didn't adopt the ideology within the country. And there was a, a strain within the um, political and religious aspect for years. Um, even though Pakistan has long um, standing relations with Afghanistan, um, Afghanistan, back, Af Afghanistan and Pakistan um, had slowly began to change uh, with their relations drastically during the middle period of, say, the 1970s. And Pakistan started supporting rebels such as um, Gulbuddin Hekmatov and Ahmad Shah Massoud and, of course, the Haqqani Neville. So these are rebels against the nationalists. These are Islamic re rebels. Against, yeah, they were fighting the Afghanistan government and uh, mm -hmm. the nationalist government. And during, uh, most notably during the Soviet uh, Afghan Soviet War, the United States started siding with Pakistan to counterattack the Soviet military and what was left of the uh, the nationalist regime, while securing their, of course, while securing their own uh, geopolitical interests in the country. And Pakistan yeah. would actually. Uh, charge Afghanistan with aiding known terrorists, incidentally, which is, I think is ironic, um, with having direct links uh, with Pakistan's even own madrasas, which were flooding Afghanistan with um, this new defensive jihad mentality. Okay, so what's the, um, what's, what's the interest then? You've got the United States jumping into this conflict because it's part of the Cold War of the Soviet Union, but perhaps, I mean, I'm just stating the bare bones of it there, perhaps you want to describe that further, who, who was involved on the US side and what the motivation was to start supplying the Afghani rebels. And, um, and also in Pakistan, what's the Pakistani motivation to be interfering in Afghanistan? Well, for the United States, it was actually simple. I mean, the CIA even knew that by, su by supporting um, the Islamists itself, it was going to help repel um, communism, which, which everyone was afraid of. They were all afraid that Afghanistan would uh, blanket the country with socialist uh, principles. And that, it, that in itself would be just be an extension of, of Russia, the uh, Soviet Union itself. And so that Soviet Union would, would expand not just um, with socialist principles, but also as a military force. And the uh, Pakistan itself uh, was threatened by this. They thought that their country would be next because they're right next door to Afghanistan. Um, so the ISI, which is the oldest intelligence service in the world. Pakistan um, intelligence. Thought, yes, the, the um, Pakistan is, is, um, ISI, the Inter-Services Intelligence Agency. And they started supplying uh, weapons to people like Gopinin Akhbatar, um, Abdul Rasul Sayyaf, and Ahmed Shah Massoud. These were the largest uh, no warlords um, in the country, they were the most influential as well. Um, more influential than, say, someone like uh, Assam bin Laden who came in later. Um, these were people that really had capricious amounts of power, um, existential, amount, extensive power within Afghanistan, within Pakistan itself. So with Pakistan, it was more of a fear of extending the branch by the Soviet Union. With the United States, it was a power for... Um, uh, uh, for geopolicy, uh, geopolitical aspects, because they didn't want the Soviet Union to be um, the the opposing power of the United States. The United States wanted to be the sole power. Okay, yeah, and I'll, I'll probably play at the start of this um, interview, I'll play Zbigniew Brzezinski's quote about when he's out there talking to the rebels or something like that, okay? So people have probably heard that already, but there was this strategy well, I could talk. You want me to talk about that for a little bit? I will. Yeah, maybe maybe the strategy uh, of bleeding the U the USSR and that kind of thing that, that was cooked up in Washington at the time. You want me to talk about that right now? I mean, I yeah. could. Is that, is that okay, a good time? Yeah. yeah. I mean, well, well, first of all, Zygmunt Brzezinski, um, for those who don't know, was the uh, national security advisor under, under Jimmy Carter. Uh, later on in 1997, he would author an important book um, called The Grand Chess Book. Um, 
in which he writes uh, with all of the other reports for the United States to make sure that no Eurasian challenges should emerge uh, of dominating Eurasia, which, uh, and also challenging America's global preeminence. It also focuses on uh, the after effects of the Soviet war um, and the United States as the, the only preeminent power um, and for its total control of Eurasia, which is basically the control over the continental landmass of uh, Europe and Asia. And Brzezinski was adamant about the United States being the sole power, so much so, uh, I'll quote from the book. Um, however, America manages Eurasia is critical. A power that dominates Eurasia would control two of the world's three most advanced regions and economically productive regions. A mere glance at the map would suggest that control of, of Eurasia would almost automatically entail Africa's uh, subordination, rendering the, the Western Hemisphere um, critical. Um, and at this, po at, at this point, about, I'd say, 75% of the world's people live in Eurasia. And Brzezinski assembled a strategy for the Soviets, which is, I, I think, twofold. And the first involved harsh economic sanctions, which would economically destabilize the country in the long run. And the second involved um, numerous countries um, like Pakistan, Egypt, and Great Britain, uh, which collaborated with the United States to provide weapons to the Mujahideen. And during the peak years of the war, it was the injunction of the Stinger missile, uh, which helped, uh, course, uh, which, which helped turn the tide of the war. Um, uh, from the U.S. military under the conditions that the Mujahideen would sign a contract um, with the State Department in full return of the weapons. Um, and believe it or not, most of the Stinger missiles were returned. Um, and however, Carter's decision to route U.S. aid through Pakistan uh, led to a massive fraud uh, as weapons were sent to Karachi instead and frequently sold on the local market rather than delivered to like say, the Afghan rebels. Yeah, okay, because the, the CIA didn't deal so much directly with the Afghanis, right? They routed everything through Pakistan and the ISI. Right, because Karachi soon, incidentally, Karachi soon became one of the most violent cities in the world. And, excuse me, this would have, a, like, a major blowback in the years to come, um, as did um, much of the... Um, uh, much of the after effects of the war. I mean, under Reagan, the war was accelerating. Mm. And through financing of the, the warlords I mentioned before, like Sayaf and Hekmatar and Masood, this would increase tenfold because this would lead many Afghan warlords to hold their own discontent with the secular U.S. But for the time being, they were accepting military aid and payments, which would help expel the Soviet invaders. So even though that we were helping um, uh, expel the Soviet Union, we were also ensuring for years to come that the Islamists themselves would be properly um, well armed. Okay, because these, these kind of characters were mentioned, like Hekmatar, can you give a sense of who they are? They're not, these aren't cuddly people by any means. I believe Hekmatar was torturing and murdering people involved in narcotics trafficking. Uh, like what I'm getting at is that the ISI were funding the worst of the worst in some ways. Right, well, I mean, well, speaking on um, Gulbuddin, Hekmatar, he was quite powerful. Uh, he was uh, the most influential, the most funded, uh, the most uh, connected uh, warlord in the world. Um, he had connections with MI6, uh, the CIA, uh, Mossad, um, Russian and Pakistani intel, ISI, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and he was actually notoriously brutal with pastors and local northern farmers. I mean, he, this is a man who would walk around um, holding a vial of uh, acidic acid and throwing it in the faces of women who didn't wear the full veil or the burqa itself. So, I mean, they, it's not like the ISI and all these intelligence didn't know what they were, they were dealing with. They knew what they were dealing with. But they were willing to, I guess, uh, look the other way in regards to his um, sadism, if you will. And... Uh, as for like the CIA, who was more than obliging to continue to support the Gulbuddin Hekmatar, um, you know, they were willing to ignore the slights. But it was alleged by the Soviets, on, I think on a multiple occasion, 
that um, the CIA agents were helping to extract um, opium out of Afghanistan in order to raise money for the Afghan resistance mm -hmm. uh, for the CIA into the Soviet into the Soviet Union. Maybe because the CIA just can't go into say the the House of Representatives and ask for money for black operations, which is illegal. So uh, most black up all black operations regarding say are funded by drug money, um, and I'll say. Uh, uh, according to like Alfred McCoy, um, th he states that the CIA supported um, Afghan drug lords like Gulbuddin Ekbatar from the Helmand province, as well as like the Nimrud's province, uh, which are home to the largest poppy fields in the world. Um, but when the Taliban took over later, um, they decreased the production, and it was uh, considered the first real war on drugs itself. But yes. Hekmatar was a very notorious figure. Okay. And he, was also, he was also a figure that was um, um, quite well connected. Because you have a parallel there, right, with, um, well, I think lots of wars around the world where there, there's been narco trafficking involved to fund the groups that intelligence agencies have wanted to fund and black ops. Um, but the direct comparison would be with this, what's going on at basically the same time in Nicaragua where the CIA were facilitating the importation of cocaine into the United States to fund the, the Contras, the groups that were opposed to the socialist Sandinistas who had taken over Nicaragua at that time. And um, I think that was quite well exposed by the journalist Gary Webb in, in California at the time. And then um, the accusation being with um, Afghanistan, that Afghanistan suddenly started supplying a lot of the United States' demand for heroin or you could say demand, maybe the demand was created by the supply in the case of heroin, um, but it became this this major supplier of it, and that was then also a result of the war. So do you, I mean, do you think that's an accurate parallel? Do you see that parallel there between the, the two situations? Absolutely. Um, I, I think the, the problem with um, Afghanistan and the United States itself was that also um, what the, especially Mullah Omar of the Taliban, actually states that um, he was willing to not burn all the poppy fields. He actually, what he wanted to do um, was to allow uh, certain warlords to extract heroin so in hopes of, of overdosing the United States on drugs in order to destroy it. I mean, this was a man also who actually believed in um, the caliphate that started within Afghanistan itself. He, he actually, the Taliban, um, just to make clear, is not an existential threat to the United you know, to the global world. What they wanted was an Islamic state just in Afghanistan and Pakistan. Um, so they didn't have the proper necessary funding, like say Al Qaeda later on, uh, to, to cause damage on a global scale. Mm -hmm. um, but what what the, what the, I think the idea was was that um, they not to just um, use the heroin uh, poppy fields to fund um, the Afghan Mujahideen in order to repel the Soviet invaders. It was also by a couple of um, Islamists themselves, hardliners, that wanted to extract heroin and, and poison the, the United States populace itself, uh, only because of their close alignment with Israel itself. And they saw them as a detriment to uh, Islamic society. And this was actually um, a, a, re um, rep a um, repetitive in its nature to Os Osama bin Laden. Osama bin Laden actually went to, not to go of course, but Osama bin Laden actually goes to Afghanistan. And while Mullah Omar accepts his uh, invitation to stay there, um, bin Laden also uh, was hoping to, uh, uh, while he's building camps, uh, uh, while, while building camps there, he also wanted to import drugs and also to destroy uh, um, the secular uh, Israeli partnership with the United States and to destroy the country from within. Okay, well, I mean, maybe this is a good time to go there because the other aspect of the conflict is the importation of foreign fighters, of um, particularly Arab fighters. Um, as I understand it, countries like Egypt saw this as an opportunity to get rid of their radicals and they emptied the jails out and sent people packing to Afghanistan in the hopes that the Russians would shoot them. So you had this influx of foreign fighters into Afghanistan, all quite radicalized at the time. So can, that's another major aspect of the, the conflict then. Yeah, well, actually, uh, President Anwar Sadat, uh, very early in his presidency, 
um, was actually quite popular amongst uh, communities in Egypt. Um, actually, his renowned vigor to prepare like the army for a confrontation with Israel, his cutbacks for the despised Egyptian secret, secret police, which were called the, the State Security Investigation Service, or the SSI for short. Um, it would actually win him like temporary favor within the community, even the Islamists themselves. So Sadat, on the other hand, also saw the threat of like um, the Muslim Brotherhood and began cracking down on the leadership later, later on in his term. And after the Yom Kippur War, Israel saw Egypt as um, an admiral foe and began taking small steps to reconcile the tenuous relationship between them. And um, uh, Sadat's administration saw fit to try also to mend relations with the, the Christian communities within Egypt. When this happened, this saw a rise of concern from the Islamists in Egypt, most notably um, al-Jihad and uh, the Muslim brother. Um, and in 1977, Sadat visited Israel. And that was a remarkable feat considering he was the first Arab leader to do so. And members of the al-Jihad, the Islamic Brotherhood, the Muslim Brothers, saw Sadat as a traitor. And worrying about the growing resentment Sadat saw, he saw an opportunity to finally rid the country of the Egyptian Islamic problem. So he jailed a lot of them. He imprisoned them, he tortured them. And by 1980, when the Afghanistan war had first commenced, Sadat, Sadat actually gave the authority to the SSI to release the prisoners, to go and fight the jihad they always wanted to have. So, they, so after the war ended, however, um, Actually, the ironically, the ones who did end up surviving became far more radicalized in the the nature of like defense of jihad, which had becoming returning back to the country they were born to, like Pakistan, Iraq, even the United States. So Egypt um, saw a resurgence of Islamic militancy during the like say the early 1990s, and it saw the rise of the Egypt and the Islamic jihad under Ahmed al Zawahiri, the Muslim Brotherhood. And of course, the funding for the Islamic Jihad in Afghanistan came from who else but Saudi Arabia under um, King Fahd bin Abdulaziz al Saud. So was the CIA sponsoring the, um, the Arabs who were flowing into Afghanistan, or was that Saudi sponsorship um, and the CIA was sponsoring the, just the native Afghans, Afghanis through Pakistan, or was there more intermingling that? I'm not quite clear, because there's obviously a lot of theories on the CIA's relationship with people like Osama bin Laden going back to the 1980s, did they have any contact or was bin Laden in a position where he was essentially self-funding and there was Saudi wealth funding? How, how much interaction was there between like um, the Americans in Afghanistan and these Arab foreign fighters? Well, actually, Saudi Arabia and I say both actually funded uh, numerous Mujahideen fighters, but with Saudi Arabia, they actually um, used Pakistan as a, um, a conduit to send um, uh, funding, uh, financial fund, uh, financial aid, uh, because they didn't want to be seen as the instigator or the antagonist for the war, because they obviously didn't have the military backing to repel like a major power, Soviet Union. But the United States would actually um, uh, directly fund, like say the MACTAB al Kidamat, which was the Afghan Services Bureau, which was headed by um, none other than Osama bin Laden, um, Ayman al Zawahiri and Abdul Azam. So the, and they actually um, funded uh, Gobuddin Hekbatar, but through the ISI. So there was a, almost like it wasn't a direct uh, from the United States to Pakistan because the United States didn't want to risk also being seen as the instigator and start World War III because uh, the Soviets didn't want, um, actually, the United States didn't want to have a direct war with the, with the Soviet Union. But I think the Soviet Union actually knew that the United States was helping funding the Mujahideen uh, resistance in Afghanistan. Okay, well, that's actually a very interesting, it's a question that's so basic, I never really thought to ask it, Adam. Um, as I said, alluded to before, there's videos of Sabine F. um in Afghanistan talking to the Mujahideen at the time. Uh, there were men of the Mujahideen um, in Ronald Reagan's, I think it's the Oval Office they were in, having chats of Reagan, which... Um, looked very funny years later in a not funny at all way, you know, when the United States were invading Afghanistan. Um, so and, and it's all very, very common knowledge now that um, there was this U.S. support for the Mujahideen in the 80s. Uh, so I, I assume the Russians knew about it at the time. They knew it was for what was going on. 
was there ever a risk of this blowing up into a, a third world war? I mean, it would be the equivalent if the Russians, um, I don't, you know, well, let's say Iran, for example, um, funding Shia Muslims in Iraq to kill U.S. soldiers. Now, the U.S. don't take kindly to this kind of thing, right? So I assume the Russians didn't particularly like the U.S. funding going in. So presumably they knew about it. Um, was there a chance of it turning into a hot war between the U.S. and Russia? Was that on the cards? Yeah, actually it was. Um, and Charlie Wilson uh, was actually uh, quite careful to deal. Charlie Wilson being a conduit for uh, the State Department into the Mujahideen itself by funding arms. Uh, they were, they had to be they had to be very careful because if they they didn't, um, what that entailed was that um, it would garner a situation like World War Three to happen. So, in other words, what the United States had to deal with um, countries that were considered questionable to them. I mean, they were dealing with you know really hardline ultra orthodox Islamists who considered the United States an enemy anyway. So, but they were willing to accept the funding. I mean, Bin Laden himself even states later on that even though I, I was I was not um, uh, friendly with the United States and I, I disliked them and their secular ideals and that they were also a, uh, a close alignment with Israel, they were more than willing to accept the, um, the funding and military aid they were, they were getting through the Mujahideen fighting. Um, so while Soviet intelligence itself didn't catch on to a direct link between the conduits in the United States, the conduits being uh, Pakistan, um, United Arab Emirates, uh, Qatar, Sudan, uh, all these countries that had uh, numerous influences within the Mujahideen, because that's where the Mujahideen's fires came from, in general, these larger Sunni populations. Um, so they were quite, the United States was actually quite careful. Okay. But it, it all came out quite quickly, right? Because I'm thinking, like, I, I can't recall the date a film like Rambo 3 was released, but that was like this overt admission, right, of U.S. I don't know if you're familiar with the film, but as Sylvester Sloan goes into Afghanistan and starts fighting Russians on behalf of the Mujahideen freedom fighters. Um, and so it, it seemed to become common knowledge soon after. Yeah, well, th I think that film came out in 83, 84. Um, so, yeah, but by then it was too late. I mean... Because the Soviet Union actually, um, you know, was too weakened to do anything about it at this point, point. Um, and they would themselves go under a new, uh, a new awakening of sense in the political sphere. Um, but yeah, the Soviet Union by that time um, had to have known that uh, the Mujahideen themselves uh, couldn't have had but help. From mm, right. So it became apparent to them as the conflict went on. Yeah. Okay, maybe um, I'd like to get back to the, the influence of the um, Islamic radicals then coming out of Afghanistan. But before we do that, could you talk us through the conclusion of the war and the consequences um, to the country of Afghanistan, the people there, of this proxy war being played out in their, on their land? Um, and do you just run us through the, the, year, like the narrative of that, the years after the war and, and all that stuff? Okay, yeah, uh, um, I, by, I think in April of 1988, um, after negotiations and uh, months of the stalemate, um, newly elected leader, Soviet um, leader, Mikhail Gorbachev, signed a peace agreement, a peace accord uh, with Afghanistan. And the Soviet Union, meanwhile, um, had tried to undergo a new uh, rev a re revitalization of sorts within their own government. The, the old um, Soviet bloc had to make a change. And Gorbachev was considered like a free thinker. And he, in turn, would also mend relations with uh, global powers, like China, like Iran. And by uh, 1987, um, the Soviet Union announced that it would uh, start withdrawing its forces. And Pakistan was a big reason why. I mean, they began working with Soviet officials to provide them um, with an exit uh, uh, from Afghanistan near the final stages of the war, uh, just to make sure that they um, they wouldn't start uh, trying to make a comeback within the war. Uh, Pakistan was very fearful of the Soviet Union itself. Uh, Gorbachev, um, I, I, um, it's, uh, well, with the announcement of the Soviet withdrawal, this gave 
um, a new like reason for the Taliban, a new resurgence to finally have a stronghold in the region. Um, and the only op opposition was Ahmed Shah Massoud of the Northern Alliance. And he would try to regain um, some of the northern borders of Afghanistan, but the, uh, the Taliban, uh, which was the more extensive threat run by Mullah Omar, I want to control the South, but by um, February 15th, 1989, uh, the last of the Soviet troops departed, uh, and the, the country immediately went to a downward spiral into a civil war, um, and it was between the Northern Alliance of Massoud and the Taliban, and meanwhile, Gubuddin Hekbatar decided, and his group, the Hizb Islami uh, political party, decided to side with the Taliban. And during the... Um, the digress of the country, the country would witness uh, two civil wars, actually, one in 89 and 92, and one in 92 to 96, and in which the Hizb Islamiyah, um, of course, was um, uh, supported by the uh, Pakistani Inter-Services Intelligence, the ISI, and they wished to take control of the country themselves, and this was a great opportunity for Pakistan itself, because what they wanted to do was send um, uh, funding straight to like the, the Taliban and Gulbuddin and destroy the opposition in itself that Pakistan would also have gained the geopolitical in between the country. Okay, so this is a question that diverts from just asking about narrative really. Um, I just want to touch upon the kind of tragic nature of it. The whole, the whole conflict. I, I read figures between a million and two million Afghanis killed um, in the, the Soviet war. Um, I can see that there was always going to be like tension in Afghanistan and problems and violence because you have this conflict between the atheistic communist government that came into power and the more conservative religious figures in the countryside. Um, but I, I just want to, you know, if you have a sense of because the whole country was used in this proxy war, do, do you have any sense of how things could have worked out in a different way, in a better way there, with a different strategy? It, it seems to me Afghanistan was used very cynically for a greater geopolitical strategy of weakening the Soviet Union, um, and not with a strategy of, like a more humanitarian strategy of what might reduce violence in the country and restore some sense of normality with the conflict breaking out. Do, do you have any opinions on that? Or? You know, actually, um, it was the warning of Mikhail Gorbachev, who said that, that after the war, the United States had to um, help repair the country itself, or they would witness the backlash of the, the ultra-Orthodox, which are now properly uh, trained and battle-hardened, if, if you will. Um, to have blowback to the United States. And because these people who return back to their country would actually start um, Islamic, uh, a new Islamic re revital revitalization um, in their own respective countries. And this would come back to the United States anyway. And I think that the United States, and, and, and this would also be a repetitive of what we're seeing in Iraq, by the way, um, when we destroyed the Saddam Hussein's Baptist party, for example, we didn't implement a backup rule or, or a more uh, stable government until much later in 2006. But by then, I mean, the country itself saw uh, mass lootings. And you had uh, numerous Islamic gangs uh, trying to battle the small parts of the turf. And that's exactly what happened in Afghanistan. I mean, you had um, numerous parties, uh, not as big as the Taliban itself, numerous parties trying to fight over mere, uh, you know, feet of land. And this would cause mass bloodshed. In fact, um, a, a quarter of what was lost during the war was actually witnessed during the two civil wars. I mean, tens of thousands of people were killed. And most of these people didn't have to be. If they just uh, uh, put in a stable government within Afghanistan itself, the United States didn't do that. They didn't, um, or whether if you want to, if you're dealing with the conspiracy theory that the intelligence agencies actually knew that this would cause a perpetual state of war with the Islamists themselves and destabilize uh, the Middle East in the future, um, I could warrant that. That could, could warrant some attention. But I don't think on the bigger picture that the United States saw um, 
that this would cause a, a blowback of epic proportions, which would haunt them years later. I mean, just a mere uh, 10 years later. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think that this could have been handled much more uh, carefully, especially on the geopolitical level, um, like I said before. But the United States didn't do that. I mean, they just used Mujahideen and they just left them there, I mean, to fight uh, within themselves. Okay, instead yeah. of just so best case scenario, it shows a complete absence of concern for the people in Afghanistan in the same way there was the absence of concern in Iraq post the war. Worst case scenario, that's a deliberate strategy, right? And we maybe can't really say or we'll ever have an answer to that. But both right. I mean, it came, well, it came out years later that um, that uh, the FBI stated that it was uh, sheer negligence on the part of the State Department itself. Um, they knew, look, they knew, they had to have known that by arming the these uh, Salafist organizations in Afghanistan, that they would bring that experience back to their own countries, which would then make the Islamist uh, revival, almost like a, a first Arab Spring of sorts, um, happening in like Pakistan, uh, uh, Indonesia, um, Sudan, um, Iraq, uh, even in um, Egypt and so forth. But I mean, these countries themselves, um, these nationalist countries themselves were um, weakening at this point. But I mean, they were now had these new um, um, Islamic uh, organizations to deal with, and they were more battle hardened and more extreme. Okay, everyone. At this point, Adam started to talk about the fallout of the Afghan war in terms of radicalized and now well trained Islamists returning to their home countries across the Muslim world. So I'm going to stop this particular episode here, and we'll get into that next time looking at the effect this had and particularly taking a look at the situation in Algeria. As the nature of the conflict there, the dirty war, raises all sorts of questions about the state's collusion with radical Islam.